Well, we're so glad to see each and every one of you here today. If you have your Bible, won't you turn to our New Testament lesson? It comes from the book of Matthew. This is chapter 21, verses 1 through 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethphage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples, saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and at once you'll find a donkey tied there with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, say that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet. Say to daughter Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, and on a colt the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt and placed their cloaks on them for Jesus to sit on. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him, and those that followed shouted, Hosanna to the Son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest heaven! When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus! The prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. This is the word of the Lord. Why don't you bow your heads with me in prayer. Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing and acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and my redeemer. Amen. Well, it's Palm Sunday, and just a year ago, a young boy had a sore throat, and his parents left him at home with a babysitter as they went to church. Well, when they were there, they waved palm fronds. They sang Hosanna, loud Hosanna. And when they came home, the little boy was eager to find out what happened at church. He asked, what happened at church, Mom and Dad? And they said, well, we waved palm fronds. We sang Hosanna in the highest. And the little boy said, what? What are palm fronds? And the parents said, oh, that's what people waved when Jesus walked by. And the little boy said, what? The one day I don't go to church on Sunday and he shows up. <laughs> We're glad you showed up. This morning, I want to take a closer look and talk a little bit about what the people in Jerusalem thought of Jesus that day. What did the Pharisees think about Jesus on that day? I want to take a look at what Scripture has to say about Jesus. And finally, I want to ask you the question that Jesus asked his disciples, Who do you say I am? We know that Jesus answered and said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. But for the people... They saw Jesus in a different light. Now remember that Jerusalem is the city of King David and King Solomon. And he was now under Roman rule. There was no Jewish king. But the people thought that Jesus would make a fantastic king. Remember, just two weeks ago, he raised Lazarus from the dead, just two miles away in Bethany. So a lot of the people that witnessed that event, they were part of the crowd that were following Jesus into Jerusalem. So there was a lot of talk, a lot of excitement about Jesus. They literally were giving him the king's welcome. In placing their coats under Jesus as he proceeded, they're doing like what was described in 2 Kings chapter 9, 13, which tells us, quote, each man took his garment and placed it under Jehu, son of Jehoshaphat, blew the trumpet saying, Jehu is king. Waving palm branches was a symbol of victory and triumph. A Roman philosopher by the same period, Cicero, said, one who has many victories is, quote, a man of many palms. The Jews used palm branches as a nationalistic symbol since the days of the Maccabean Revolt. Remember, Judah Maccabee was the son of Matthias. He had four sons. Judah was the middle child. They led a revolt against the Romans several hundred years prior to free them from the tyranny of Rome. And they signed the first peace treaty with Rome. 
And so a lot of the Jews looked at Jesus like their revolutionary hero. Kind of the way that we look at George Washington, who led our revolution against King George III of England and freed us from the tyranny of England. So the Jews looked at Judah Maccabee as their revolutionary war hero. So here comes Jesus, and they're thinking, this is our chance. Maybe at last we'll be free from the Romans. The people were shouting, Hosanna, Hosanna. In Hebrew, that literally means, please save. We're saved now. They were all quoting Psalms 118, 26 and giving Jesus a messianic title, saying, Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the King of Israel. Everyone sang those psalms during Passover, so all those psalms were fresh in their mind. So I think that a lot of the Jews during that time were really hoping that Jesus would be part of their, their freedom from Rome that he would be their literal king. But what were the Pharisees thinking as Jesus entered Jerusalem in all that excitement? The Pharisees saw Jesus as a threat. They enjoyed their popularity. They enjoyed how people needed them. And they saw Jesus as a competition. Jesus threatened to take away what they longed to keep. They longed for the praise of men, and Jesus was getting all the praise. They desired the best seats in the synagogue, and Jesus was getting a hero's welcome. They gave tithes, and they prayed openly, so people would marvel at their spiritual works. But now the people were marveling at Jesus' works. You know, it's hard to get followers when the other guy is raising the dead. Jesus was stealing their thunder. And this is why they sought to kill him. If you look at John chapter 11, verse 47, my Bible says, Therefore the chief priests and the Pharisees can be the council, and were saying, What are we doing? For this man is performing many signs. If we let him go along like this, all men will believe in him. And the Romans will come and take away both our place and our nation. Their jealousy of Jesus was so bad that even Pilate could recognize it. My Bible says in Matthew 27, 18, quote, for he knew that because of envy, they handed him over. On Jesus' entry into Jerusalem, when the people see crying out, Hosanna to Jesus, they're, they're outraged by that. And they tell Jesus to literally have the people stop praising him. Quote, teacher, rebuke your disciples in Luke chapter 19, verse 39. They are so frustrated because no matter how hard they try, it's just not working. And they get frustrated towards each other. In John chapter 12, verse 19, my Bible says, So the Pharisees said to one another, You see that what you're doing isn't any good. Look, the whole world has gone after him. So if the Jews saw Jesus as their new king, who would free them from the Romans, and if the Pharisees saw Jesus as competition, then what does Scripture have to say about Jesus, especially in the Old Testament? What does our Bible say? Well, Scripture clearly says that Christ is the Lord. Jesus knew the Scripture. This is why on his way to Jerusalem, he ensured the prophecy about him would be fulfilled. He sent two of his disciples on ahead of him to get a donkey for him to ride into Jerusalem. This was to fulfill the prophecy about Christ that was written in the Old Testament in the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. My Bible says, Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout in triumph, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you. He is just and endowed with salvation, humble and mounted on a donkey, even on a colt, the foal of a donkey. What else does the Old Testament have to say about Jesus? Look at Psalms, chapter 22. My Bible says, all who see me sneer at me. That would definitely be the Pharisees. My bones are out of joint but not broken. Tongue cleaves to my jaws. A band of evildoers have encompassed me. They pierce my hands and my feet. From my clothes they cast lots. But most importantly, on this Palm Sunday, just like the disciples, I believe that Jesus is still asking each of us, who do you say I am? And 
he says who he is clearly in Mark chapter 8, verse 27 to 38. My Bible says Jesus' disciples went to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, who do people say I am? They replied, um, some, some say John the Baptist. <laughs> Others say Elijah. Still others, one of the prophets? But what about you? He asked. Who do you say I am? Peter answered, you're the Messiah. Now, how did Peter know that? Why did the other disciples, there were 12 of them. So why did the other disciples say, you're the Messiah? What was it about Peter that gave him that awareness? I think that Peter had a special encounter with Jesus that solidified this knowledge in his mind. And it's earlier in the book of Mark, chapter 6, verse 45 to 52. This is where Peter walks on the water toward Jesus. And this event, I believe, culminated his faith in Christ. My Bible says, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into a boat and go out ahead of them to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. After he dismissed them, he went up on the mountainside by himself to pray. Later that night, he was there alone, and the boat was already a considerable distance from land, buffeted by waves because the wind was against it. And shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them, walking on the lake. Well, when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's the ghost, they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. That's the first exercise of his faith. Tell me to come to you. Come, he said. Verse 29, Then Peter got down out of the boat and walked on the water and came toward Jesus. Why did the other disciples get out of the boat? Yeah. They didn't exercise their faith. I think they believed that Jesus was the way, the truth, and the life, as most Christians do. But just like most Christians, they don't exercise their faith. Peter had to get out of the boat. He had to step onto the water. Now something happened in verse 30. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid, and beginning to sink, cried out, Lord, save me! When you step out in faith, you got to keep your eyes on Jesus. If you look away at the waves, the wind, and everything that buffets your life, don't be surprised if you feel like you're sinking. You've got to keep your eyes on Jesus. Now, again, Peter exercises his faith a third time by saying, Lord, save me. He doesn't just let himself sink. He believes that Jesus can save him. I think this event was a culminating factor that led Peter to say, you're the Messiah. Verse 31, immediately Jesus reached out his hand, caught him, you have little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they returned, he climbed into the boat, the wind died down, then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, truly you are the Son of God. Even more clearly, Jesus helps us to know who he is by clearly stating his identity. Remember what he said to Thomas. If you have your Bible, take a look at John chapter 14, verse 1. Don't let your hearts be troubled. Jesus said, you believe in God, believe also in me. My Father's house has many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I'm going there to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come back and I'll take you to be with me so that you can be where I am. You know the way to the place I'm going. Verse 5, 
Thomas said to him, oh, Lord, we don't know where you're going. So how can we know the way? Verse 6, Jesus answered, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you really know me, then you know my Father as well. From now on, you do know him, and you've seen him. This is a reaffirmation of the Trinity. Jesus is clearly saying that he is the embodiment of God. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. If you've seen him, you've seen me. If you know me, you know him. Indeed, how does Jesus show us that he's the way? Because I think that there's a problem in America today when we think of Jesus being the way, the truth, and the life. Most Christians would profess that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. But ask yourself this question. When was the last time you let Jesus have his way with your life? When was the last time you let Jesus have his way with your cell phone? When was the last time you let Jesus have his way with all of your relationships? When was the last time you let Jesus have his way with your finances? We say that he's the way, the truth, and the life, but we don't exercise our faith. When was the last time you let Jesus have his way with your leisure time? I think just like many of the disciples, instead of walking on the water, we're still in the boat. Because we don't exercise our faith. How does Jesus show us the way to live? Look with me at Mark chapter 12, verse 28 through 31. The most important commandment is this one, answered Jesus. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. And the second one is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There's no greater commandment than these. How is Jesus the way, the truth, and the life? Well, he shows us the way to live. Love God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with all of your mind, with all of your strength. Love your neighbor as yourself. That's the way we should live. But Jesus goes on to show us the truth about God. This is in Colossians chapter 2, verses 9 through 10. My Bible says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And in Christ, you have been brought to fullness. He's the head over every power and authority. Again, it's a reaffirmation of what's the truth? Jesus is part of the Trinity. He is God. He's Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, the three in one. All the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form. And finally, what does scripture say about Jesus being the life? Do you remember the book of John? How it starts out in the beginning was the word. The word was with God. The word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him. Without him was not anything made that was made. Verse 4, in him was life. And that life became the light of all mankind. If you skip down to verse 14, it says, And the Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That's Jesus. And we beheld his glory, the glory that of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. And his life became the light of all mankind. It's pretty clear what Scripture has to say about Jesus and, and who he is. And it's pretty clear what Jesus said about himself. I am the way. No one 
comes to the Father except by me. If you're privy to other ideologies, be careful. Because Jesus said that he's the only way to the Father, and that is a huge stumbling block for most Americans. Friends, if it's your prayer today to exercise your faith by getting out of the boat and letting Jesus have his way with your life, and by actively believing that he is the way, the truth, and the life, then won't you join us as Eva comes up to play, what a friend we have in Jesus. This is on page 435. Believe this and go in his grace and love. And 